Hello, my name is Kishwani. S K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the SAT. We have been solving math problems, SAT math problems, out of this book here, the SAT Official Study Guide, 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. This book must be in front of you at all times when you're working with me. Don't, don't just sit there and stare at the screen passively. Do the problems with me. Today we'll solve some problems that, that you will find on page number 341. Let's take a look at it. Page 341, number 1. After, after having watched this video, if you find it helpful, and if you decide that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as your tutor to help you get ready for the exam, you can reach me at kishwaniprep at icloud.com. Let's take a look at the first one. It says that we have a helicopter which has the initial altitude initial altitude at T0 at 40 feet. This is red by the way that I just wrote down. It is read as T0, N-A-U-G-H-T, which means zero obviously. Something that we learned on day number, let me just look it up here, uh, day number 74. Work on your vocabulary. Work on your vocabulary. It's very important that you have decent vocabulary if you have any hope at all of getting a decent score in the reading part. On my channel you will find a series of 100 videos that will help you just that. This particular word we learned on day number 74 as I said. Just type in Kashwani SAT vocabulary words. Day 74 the video will pop right up. You will learn that word and some other useful words. So at T0 when we start out the, the helicopter is hovering at 40 feet. And after that, we are told that it gains, it gains 21 feet each second. The question is very straightforward. The question simply is, how do we convey this idea in the form of an, form of an equation? It's very simple. They are using letter y to represent altitude as a function of time. And when the time is zero, at t zero, it is 40 feet. That's your intercept. And then after that, it, it gains 21 feet every second. 21 feet every second. And that's all that is. That's the function. Very simple, very straightforward. Number two. Of course it's very simple and very straightforward because it's number one. Number two. In number two we are, we are going to pay a flat fee of five dollars or up to or up to 100 messages. We are sending apparently text messages and the company tells us uh, that uh, for the first 100 text messages you are going to pay 500 or five dollars and after that after that, you're going to pay 25 cents for each additional. Again, they want us to represent, oh this time rather, not in the form of an, form of an, form of an equation, but rather in the form of a graph. Let's do that. So, we start out here. The amount that we pay, the amount that we pay depends on the messages. Messages is the independent, independent variable obviously. And we are told that for the first 100 messages, we don't have to worry about how much we're going to pay. It's fixed. It's, fixed. it's five dollars. What happens? What happens after that? It's twenty-five cents for each additional. Twenty-five cents for one for for each one additional additional message. Which means for the next one hundred messages, after the first one hundred, for the next one hundred messages, we'll end up paying one hundred quarters. One hundred quarters is twenty-five dollars. As you can see, it's going to have a very steep slope. So if this is 100, the 200 is going to be somewhere here, and for 200, we're going to pay, if this is 5, it's going to be 10, 15, 20, somewhere way up here. It's a very steep slope, somewhere up here. Anyway, that's what it looks like. That's, that's, the, that's the shape of the graph. Graph with a very steep slope. We don't want to worry about, we don't want to worry about the steepness of the slope, because obviously they're not going to give you two, two answer choices, one with that one with a shallow slope and one with a steep slope, that's not going to happen. We simply have to recognize the shape of it. And that's all it is. And that, uh, that one is answer choice A. Let's go to the next one. Number three. Number three says that we, we have a
we have a person up there apparently in a movie theater and he has a bag of, bag of popcorn and he's eating the popcorn out of the bag that he had just purchased and we are told that within the first 15 minutes he finishes half the bag. After having finished half the bag in the first 15 minutes, after that he stops, he stops eating. He stops eating for 30 minutes. It starts again. It starts again. It doesn't matter when it starts again. He starts again some point in time. Well, actually, he stops at 30 minutes, so we know when he starts. He stops again at the beginning of the 45th minute. And then what happens? Then it turns out that he, all of a sudden, he just drops the bag. He just drops the bags on the floor, and that's the end of the story. And we want, and they want us to convey this story in the form of a graph. Let's do this, shall we? So again here, our time will be the independent variable because how how much the bag is empty depends on how much time has lapsed. You understand? And here is our popcorn. I'm not sure if popcorn is two words or one word. I think it's just one word. Not that it well I was gonna say not that it matters, but of course it matters. We are here to learn language or we are here to learn math. We are not here to butcher the English language. Okay, let's begin. So we're going to start with a full bag, and here's half half a mark. And how long it takes? First 15 minutes. There we go. So here's our 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and so forth. 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and so forth. For so the first 15 minutes, within the first 15 minutes, we started out with a full bag. We started out with a full bag. Within the first 15 minutes, we're down to half. And then what happens? We stop eating. We stop eating for the next 30 minutes until 45 minutes. We stop eating, which means which means the level of popcorn in the bag is not depleting. It's, it's constant. And then we start again. Eat, then we start eating again. And as we start eating again, the, the popcorn depletes. It keeps going down. At some point in time, we drop the bag. We drop the bag and that's where the story ends. At what time we drop the bag is not really important. Even though in the graph, I think, let me just take a quick look at it. Yes, in the, in the, in the answer choices, they make it look like it happened precisely at 90 minutes. But that's not the point here. We just want to be able to recognize the shape. When it drops the bag, we really don't care. So this is what the shape is. We started at full bag. We finished half the bag in the first 15 minutes. Nothing happens in the next half an hour. Then we start again eating. And the, the, the level of popcorn depletes and then we drop the bag. There is the answer. And that is answer choice A. A is the, or rather B. I was looking at the answer choice for question two. Uh, answer choice B is the one that matches. Answer choice A is ludicrous because all of a sudden he has more pop, more popcorn in the bag. At the end of the story, it's silly. Number four. Number four. Oh, number four is very childish. Makes you wonder why the bloody thing is even there. It's just too silly. We are told that 2x, 20 minus x is equal to 15. The question is how much is 3x? Let's find out, shall we? Bring the x to the other side, bring 15 to this side, and x will become 5. And we want 3x, so multiply both sides by 3, and it's 15. It's just too silly. Now, we're not going to complain about it, because too silly means it's a gift. It's very easy. Just take it and move on. Don't complain. The next one is just, just as easy. We're given a function, f of x, we are told, is x plus 3 over 2. And the question is, question is, what's the value of this function when x equals negative 1? Let's find out, shall we? f of, f of negative 1 is going to be, where we see x, we replace it with negative 1, plus 3 over 2. Negative 1 and positive 3 is going to be 2 over 2. It's just 1. It's just 1, and that's answer to I see. Let's look at number 6.
number six says that we have a what do we have here? Do we have an equation here? No, it's not an equation. Equation is so called because it has, it has an equal sign in it. What we have on the blackboard is not an equation, it is called an expression, an algebraic expression. And our job is to simply expand it. That's all. They simply want us they simply want us to exp expand the bloody thing, which we'll do right now. So 2x times x squared is simply going to be 2x cubed, and then 2x times 3x, 2 times 3 is 6, and x times x, x squared is just 6x six squared. That's all there is. That was number 6. Nothing to it, very straightforward, very simple. Let's move on to number 7. Number 7 is a little bit more elaborate. Number 7 is a little bit more elaborate, so stay with me. Here we are told that we have 50 stores. We have 50 stores. And we are told we are told to do a survey. Survey about job satisfaction. So apparently, apparently this corporation owns stores in 50 different locations. You happen to work in the corporate headquarter and you're given a job to do a survey to figure out how satisfied the employees are to gauge their job satisfaction. The question is, how do we go about doing the survey? How do we go about collecting the data? And that's all it is. Let's go through the answer choices. As we go through the answer choices, we'll see which one makes sense. It says, it says, number one, number A says, select one store. You have 50 stores. You cannot just go and collect, uh, ask few people in one store how happy they are about a job and assume that that's going to reflect on all 50 stores. That's just silly. That will only be valid if you were trying to measure the job satisfaction of employee in that particular store, not all 50 of them. If you want to measure the, measure some any, any kind of variable for all, over all 50 stores, you have to take some random sample from all the stores, obviously. Hey, silly. Let's not worry about B right now. Let's take a look at C. C says, survey the highest paid and the lowest paid. That's even more silly. You don't want to go around asking the lowest paid employee how satisfied about it, how satisfied they are about the job. They are pissed as, they are pissed off as it is. That's not a balanced survey. Is it? No, of course not. That's not a balanced survey. Answer choice D says create create an online. Again, I think online is one word. Create online survey. Create a website, an online survey, let people uh, come there and, 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 uh, and, and take part in the survey and on, once, once that has happened, we'll simply collect the first 50. No, that doesn't work either because that has a selection bias because people who are most likely to take part in such a thing are either the people who are very upset at you or people who are extremely happy at you. Most people who are, when you buy something, the only time you leave a review is when some bad experience happens or if you're really happy with it. But that's not a balanced sample. The answer is B. The answer is B, which simply say, which simply say, which, which simply says select 10 at random, at random, 10 people at random from each store. That's the part, each store. We go in each store, we collect 10, 10 people at random and we ask them how satisfied they are with their job and that samples should do a very good job of reflecting how employees all, all uh, employees overall in all the store feel about their job satisfaction. It was a lot of lecture. A lot of sermon for something very simple. Number eight. In number eight, we are told that the slope of I
when we're not told anything, actually we're being asked to compare the slope of I versus slope of J. And this is what we're told. Again, none of these things is going to make much sense to you unless you have the book in front of you, as I repeat all the time. You must have the book in front of you, so you know what the hell J is, and you know what the hell I is, and you know what's going on. Because you read the problem yourself. J, we are told, goes up by $100 every two weeks, every two weeks. And how do we know that? By looking at the graph. The graph that they give us, by looking at the graph, if you look at the graph you will see that initially, initially J has a deposit of $300 in the account. And if you look at the graph you will see that that $300 goes to $400 at the end of week two. And you will further see that that $400 that he has, balance that he has, 400 goes to $500 at the end of week 4. And that's how we know, that's how we know that he, his deposit goes up by $100 every two weeks. Similarly, if you look at the I, we notice that it goes up $100 each week. The difference between J and I is that J's deposit goes up by $100 every two weeks, and I's deposit goes up $100 every week. Since, since J's deposit goes up $100 every two weeks, which means that his deposit goes up by $50 every week. The $100 every two weeks is the same as $50 every week. This goes up by $50 every week. This goes up $100 every week. And the question was, uh, how much more is I depositing in the account? And the answer is, I, therefore, I deposited $50 more, that's the keyword here, $50 more each week than, than the J. That's all. The question was how much more how much more is I deposited in the account compared to J? And the answer is $50. I'm going to read the question to you verbatim. It says after they had after they made their initial deposit, how much more did Ian's deposit? Every, how much more did Ian deposit each week than Jeremy? Ian deposited fifty dollars more per week compared to Jeremy. That's what it is. Okay, sometimes it helps to read the problem verbatim because then we know what's going on. Number nine. Again, some of these words are very simple for you, obviously. Some of the, uh, and for some, some of you, it, they will not be that simple words. It all depends on your level of vocabulary. Verbatim. Look, or learn it. It simply means to say something verbatim. Simply means to say it word for word, exactly the way it was said. Instead of saying that I'm quoting right now, I'm quoting him right now. You just say I'm going to tell you verbatim what he said to me. Verbatim is the word we learned. Just give me one second. I'm going to look it up and tell you if I can find it very quickly. I know we learned it. Oh, there you go, day number 73. Again, the same routine, just type in Keshwani, SAT vocabulary words, day 73, the video will pop right up and learn the word. Number nine. Number nine is a very straightforward, very simple question. We are given a function, h of x, we are told, equals 2 raised to x, and we are being asked to figure out the difference between h of 5 and h of 3. What's the value of the function when x is equal to 5 as opposed to when x is equal to 3? That's all, the difference in the two. h of 5 is simply going to be 2 raised to 5. And don't just take a chance, just do it out. It only takes a few seconds. 4, 8, 16, and 32. So that's 32. 2 raised to 5. You see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I didn't make a mistake. And, it, and h of 3 is actually very simple. That's 2 raised to 3. That's just 8. So it's 32 minus 8, 32 minus 8, 32 minus 10, 32 minus 10 would have been 22. We're not subtracting 10, we're only subtracting 8, so instead of 22, it's going to be 24. It's going to be 24. And that is answer choice C. That's the end of page number 343. And I think I'm going to stop right here because I don't want video to be way too long. 
We'll meet again tomorrow and we'll pick up from where we left off here on page 343. We'll start our work from the next page, obviously, 344, in case you were not into suspense. So, are you going to create unnecessary suspense? That's, that's what happens in the story. After 343 comes 344. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Send me an email, as I said, if you want to get hold of me at kashwaniprep at icloud.com. Bye now.